veterinary consultant here looking at um, precision microbes advanced gut stabilizer lambs getting a lot of positive feedback uh, from flocks this year using the product uh, so I suppose we're kind of in the tail end of lambing maybe the middle of lambing for some farms but just maybe a review some top tips around lambing and the application of precision microbes what is uh, advanced gut stabilizer for lambs what is actually designed for um, I'm the consultant, veterinary consultant working with precision microbes. I have a lot of experience over the years working particularly in the farm animal space and looking at prevention of disease. But I have to say working with microbes over the last uh, two and a half years has been by far the most exciting project that I've got to work in because of the results we're seeing. Significant challenges in the marketplace like the reduction of maybe oral antibiotics in lambs and then to be involved with something that's bringing a solution to the marketplace um, with vets and farmers is really exciting. So going and reviewing top tips for successful lambings. What are the key areas to concentrate? Well, I think there's a role for biological solutions in lamb health, but we need to look at some of the other simple principles we have to get right that are really, really important. So your nutrition is really important. Colostrum obviously is huge, hygiene space. I'll talk about sheep signals and air movements in the shed as well, and hopefully I'll make a little bit of sense as I go along. So nutrition in the O is really important, and it's kind of challenging when we look at um, the size of the fetus as it grows. You know, it does a lot of its growth in the last trimester. So three quarters of the growth occurs in the last third of pregnancy, and that puts an impact and pushes on room, the size of the rumen, so the ability of the sheep to intake feed. Um, so that physical size of the lamb is massive. 60% increase in energy and protein in the final two weeks of pregnancy. That's important from the yo, from a nutritional point of view, but also from the lamb and a colostrum quality point of view. So we obviously want to get our minerals right, calcium being the big one, trace minerals as well. And we do that by looking at the farm history and knowing what we're putting in. So the quality of forage or silage is really important. And then what amount of protein do we need to supplement yo's and what uh, amount of energy do we need to supplement depending on the parity to how many lambs they're, they're, they're carrying. And this is one of the key factors to help yo's lamb down successfully minimizing twin lamb disease, maximizing lamb health and maximizing colostrum quality. Um, so nutrition in the yo's is really important. So when I talk about sheep signals, it comes from my work in cow signals, and this is like understanding what sheep want. So uh, herd species, they're a species of prey, um, there's certain things we need to recognize within the flock. Um, feed space is a huge one, particularly as we come up to lambing time. So we can have the best diet in the world, but if we don't have enough space for sheep to get access to that and eat it comfortably, well, that's a problem. And we must remember as a herd species, they'll feed together and lie down together. So particularly our, our, our yos carrying more um, higher parity yos, they're more vulnerable, but we'll often group or pen yos into parity anyway. Um, a really important thing I would say is a clean, dry bed and space per yo. It's a huge not bottleneck, particularly when we come up to lambing time. So it can cause a significant amount of stress. And a nutrient I often think that's often forgotten is water quality. Um, so not water, not the, like this farmer above washing or dipping the sheep. I don't know what actually is happening in this picture. I just pulled it off the internet. But water is a really important nutrient. And particularly when we look at challenges from lambs and E. coli, I think it's it become, going to become of increasing significance as we learn more about water quality and the impact it has on disease even. I think space is the final frontier. It really is a big bottleneck on farm. Um, it leads to more stress, reduced feed intakes, and build up of infection pressure. So if we have more sheep in a space, well then that's going to put pressure on the shed, disease, the environment, the amount of fecal matter that's in there. So it's a it's a it's a really one that needs to be looked at in every farming system, be it intensive or extensive livestock, um, or cattle sheep or maybe intensive livestock we need to look at space because it's a really important one we put animals indoors to minimize pressure to give more space per yo and um, especially as they come up close to lambing so space costs money i'm aware of that so it's a long-term investment certainly on, for, on flocks maybe um, but we're trying to optimize biology by by looking at what does a sheep want uh, giving maximizing that in indoors and here's some uh, Chagas figures around uh, space per yo be it on slats bedded and looking at meal feeding and i think we always need to go to the top end or if not beyond this for success 
And again, if simple things, we look into a shed and we think about maybe a yo in the corner of a feeding pen, you know, that yo feeding here might knock out uh, a lot of concentrated feeding space as well. Air movements in shed. I think this is a really, really important one. Um, we talk more and more about maybe in calves and cows about air movement and air, air, fresh air ventilation, but it's really important in our sheep sheds as well. And the problem is the yo and the lamb have different requirements. The yo is a, obviously a ruminant and obviously generates quite a bit of heat uh, and can tolerate quite low temperatures and there's no problem with fresh air where the lamb is much more prone to the cold. Um, so certainly yo's coming up to lambing, I would have uh, more open sheds is, is where I'd always look for. But then when we look at the lambing time and the lambing pens, we have to be mindful that those lambs, while we want the fresh air to do its job in the pens, it can, it can make lambs quite cold. It is a big bottleneck in sheep sheds, particularly for yo's coming up to lambing time. If we think of some of the disease pressure we see is huge benefit to more space and more air movements at a low level um, and balancing that with cold lambs can be a challenge and that can be an individual farming thing so the real thing with your housing good air movements reduce the infection pressure so they keep the bed dry they reduce pathogens in the air um, and leading to often a cleaner uh, other as well as we come up to lambing because um, if we think the lamb suckling on that other you know if we don't get them uh, it's not always colostrum going in there so we can keep that other as clean as possible from a lamb health perspective so air movements really important to look at in shed we can use smoke bombs we can use different methods to do that so clean water, um, why? Well, I have started doing a lot of work in the water space and looking at um, E. coli counts, just doing potable water testing, um, certainly looking at a huge number of farms where we've looked at well water, we looked at you know, the challenges of what's actually in the water. And I think it's an area that I'm becoming interested in. I don't have all the answers, but if I look at some farming systems, maybe more intensive livestock, what they do with water and treatment of water, probably something we could learn there from that. Um, obviously the cost of these systems is a factor, but I think it is important we look at some of the diseases like E. coli, so these pathogens multiplying. And E. coli can survive for quite a long time in water. Um, and then we think about lamb health. Well, it makes sense that we might think about water a little bit more. Also, if we look at water access, you know, availability of, of water within pens is really important. Flow rate keeps it clean. And a yo will drink six to eight litres of water a day. And they're a large fermentation bath, essentially, with that rumen. So water is a really important ingredient. So when I'm looking at farms now, I will increasingly look at water as part of my checklist approach for an overall health assessment. Again, E. coli, we, I'm going to explain a little bit about what E. coli does later on um, and how it, you know, it, it breaks down and causes issues like water amount. So we need to look at water in the, in the context of yo's and health, but as well with lambs. And this is a pig study, but it shows you the survival times of E. coli uh, versus other pathogens. You know, E. coli can survive in water for quite a long time. And also, I'm reading a lot of research around E. coli as a primer for a lot of these other clostridial diseases and other pathogens we might see affecting lambs and calves. Colostrum quality is key. Again, it's the old story of colostrum, but you know, it really is the foundation when it comes to lamb health. Colostrogenesis occurs uh, in probably 10 to 14 days prior to lambing. So they start brewing up the colostrum in the, their others as they approach lambing time. It's a much higher percent of solids. solids. You know, if you compare uh, sheep's colostrum to other animals' colostrum, it's very high in fat uh, to feed that young lamb, particularly from a cold perspective, and it's very high in protein as well. So it's actually a good human product uh, if you were looking at it, but uh, we're not gonna be drinking yo's colostrum. But, um, What's important to remember is that high percentage of solids during clostrogenesis requires a significant amount of energy and protein. And if you go back a couple of slides, that's why we talk about 60% increase in energy and protein requirements uh, coming up to lambing time. So this is where we look at supplementation um, with something like soybean meal or other protein supplements um, being an important uh, component of good nutritional management from a colostrum quality point of view. So high quality protein energy source, uh, particularly where we have yo's with higher parity and more lambs, it can be a really beneficial thing to have uh, focus in on nutrition from a lamb health perspective as well as the yo. So, you know, nutrition has a huge impact on colostrum quality. We have to remember that. Genetics and parity play a role. We can test colostrum in our flocks. 
We're using a BRICS refractometer, it's like a little telescope. Um, some people use the reference of 22%. I try and push that up to 24%. Uh, again, there's work been done on it. 22% is often cited as the kind of the benchmark, but I think 24% is something um, that I would reference. Um, so we, we need quality cross colostrum, we need a right quantity of it, we need uh, it to get into the lamb quickly, so we want to minimize the stochia and problems. But another thing we need to look at is clean colostrum. So we don't want bugs and bacteria getting in ahead of colostrum and that lamb is sucking under the underbelly of a dirty yo or a dirty udder. Um, and the best way to do this, the simplest way to do it, is by having plenty bedding and straw in our, our close-up lambing pens, our close-up pens in our lambing pens in particular. And we get that right by having good drainage, having good fresh air movement and space. And that helps keep the udder of the yo clean. So physically as clean as we can do it on a farm. And that, may, that has huge benefits from a yo uh, and a lamb perspective. So plenty bedding, good drainage underneath the bedding, uh, fresh air movements, and enough space per yo so we're not overcrowding. And that will really help keep that clean colostrum piece. I think on farms as well, something I would have worked on over the years is a vulnerable, a vulnerable if I can pronounce it, lamb plan. So we know when we have higher parity yos and we have weak lambs or hard lambings, you know, like triplets or quads, um, we need a lot of focus on these. Um, certainly the lambs get more vulnerable during bad weather and we've seen three or four weeks of bad weather in the Irish system here and later lambing when infection builds up. So we need a plan. When the weather is cold in particular, and um, because the lamb is very prone to the cold, they use up this brown fat energy store around his kidneys and heart, particularly the kidneys, um, we need to be really, really focusing in on lamb health and vulnerable lamb management around this time. So really focusing on that 50 mils of colostrum as quickly as possible um, after birth, um, and 200 mils per kilo in the first 24 hours. Um, one thing people will talk a lot about when you have triplets or higher parities and um, what others what you know colostrum supplements there's a huge variability in the quality of colostrum supplements so look at each supplement and unfortunately they're linked to price um, with using cow colostrum it's an option but I have seen you know it can cause hemolytic anemia so you're better pooling it if you're using it across lambs so what's the plan for vulnerable lambs on the farm um, really focusing prioritizing those weaker lambs or those smaller lambs or dystochia cases hard lambings getting colostrum tubed or bottled you know anytime you're you're harvesting colostrum if you have excess of it storing it and maybe uh, getting into the freezer quickly and cleanly into little ziploc bags that can be defrosted quickly hygiene when we're handling colostrum we need to warm up these lambs fostering is an option getting energy in there um, into those young lambs in the form of colostrum or milk there is some drenches we can use for for lambs in it from an energy perspective um, there's a glucose injection so it can be given if we look at the lambs navel here it's about a mil or sorry centimeter to the left and centimeter down this spot here we can do it but you you aim the the needle with the, uh, the 10 mil uh, of 20 percent dextrose solution uh, aim the needle from the navel down to the tail get your own vet to go through that and of course behind my head here you can't see it is a warming box so just having a vulnerable lamb plan does uh, decrease mortality um, on farm, particularly in the middle of a busy lambing season. So hygiene is really important as well. It's a big one, but it's a hard one. So these purple little circles represent, represent our pathogens like E. coli. Um, and if we think about the lamb, the first start for the uh, at birthing, here's the lamb's head uh, coming out of the canal, um, is the environment. So if we have a lot of pathogens in the environment, if we have favorable conditions, poor air movements, a lot of dirty bedding, a lot of yo's in a small space at lambing time, um, we create the favorable conditions for pathogens. Then if we have high humidity and poor weather conditions, that stresses uh, the situation even more. Um, so we really want to look at how we can reduce down infection pressure. Um, and again, even our hands ourselves, we can be a source of infection. So hygiene, really focusing on fresh air, drainage, plenty bedding for yo's is huge. And I'll talk about utensils. Um, and our hands as well, because you know we lambs are more vulnerable. They need to get their immunity from their mothers through colostrum. It's a key time, and the more focus we have on hygiene, the better results. So lamb targets, you know, scanning is often vanity, and lamb sold is sanity. So we want to look at getting live lambs up and suckling and past that initial risk period. And um, if we think about our figures, um, well, we know that there's a 
knock-on effect as we go through the lambing season from scanning times to lambs sold and what we're trying to do is create good habits to minimize this so when i talk about the vulnerable lamb plan it is around good habits in an area where you could lose more lambs if you don't have it versus increasing it. It's a bottleneck in the system. And it's like links in a chain uh, as we look at it. And some weak links, say if we have poor colostrum for one year or another, some of those links are out of our control, be it bad weather. Um, and I like this Japanese phrase that you can apply to life or business called Kaizen. Um, and it's just changing habits for the better. So reviewing your system, reviewing all those links in the chain, be it nutrition, lambing time, and lamb management, Management or, or, or and seeing where the small changes can be made to make gradual improvements. We're never going to achieve perfection in farming, but it is about consistent progress all the time. So lamb mortality, we focus in on the very uh, narrow window of the lambing period. 50% of lamb mortality occurs in the first 24 to 48 hours. So when we exclude our um, abortion cases, um, there's a very high rate of mortality. So this is where a key time at your busiest time, we need to look at time, habits, and behaviors. And when I think about time, habits, and behaviors, is how easy can we bed down straw? How easy is it to clean utensils? What are the behaviors that we can help make uh, a difference with on farm? So really areas to for lambs is hygiene, colostrum, and critical care. So hygiene, again, from a lamb perspective, the main source of most of our diseases uh, in our lambs, particularly like E. coli, start out as the, the mother, the, the yo. She carries a lot of E. coli in her dung. It's a normal thing. Um, so we need to minimize lamb exposure to that within the environment itself. But the yo can also be a carrier for strep agalactia, which can cause joint tilt. So space helps keeping the other clean when the lamb is suckling. Uh, plenty straw um, and clean, you know, just look at clean disinfectant, liming, all those sort of simple things really help with hygiene. When we're handling the yo as well, um, it can be a time to remember that yo's are carriers of things like strep agalactia, which causes um, joint ill. Um, so we need to be mindful of that infection pressure when we're handling yo's. We think about um, a vulnerable lamb, maybe a triplet or a weak lamb, and we're doing at lambing time. You know, just beware that our hands can be a source of spread of infection, and that's why we do advocate the use of gloves. Now, I was a vet in practice for many, many years, and I always found it easier to lamb yours without gloves. But until I really understood the risk around spreading of disease, that you know, I forced myself to to wear gloves, and it's good practice. So it's about simple techniques as well, um, simple habits to make cleaning easier and make hygiene better. I'm all about that from a farm systems point of view. How can we make things simple? So if we look at what the bacteria like, well, I talked about that from a shed perspective, so we can try and reduce the environment that that would like. We're also, I'm also involved in really interesting research on environmental microbes controlling the pathogens there. And we're, we're, we're doing some nice work there uh, by looking at the, putting in good bacteria, infusing good environmental microbes into the environment, how beneficial that can be. So if we think about um, cleaning, having a simple protocol, here's a, a, a picture I got from a Chagas slide, and I think it works well, the three buckets, just having cold water and washing up liquid. That's a detergent, so the detergent will break down a lot of the slime and bacterial uh, biofilm around uh, a different equipment, be it colostrum or feeding tubes or lambing equipment, um, and then washing it off in cold water, washing off that detergent, and then using cold water and just a simple sterilizer like Milton or paracetic acid. So that three-step process is good. So we're cleaning uh, with a detergent, then we're, we're rinsing in cold water, and then we're sterilizing the equipment. And you know, this is for your ropes, your lambing aids, your feeding bottles. How often should you be doing it? As much as you possibly can. The more attention that goes into hygiene, the better the results. In larger farms, you know, these, this is a system that I've used where we use uh, blue barrels cut in half. Very simple system, trying to reduce infection pressure, make it easier, and often letting that last bucket once it's clean of cold water and sterilizer, just keeping the lambing equipment in it. We want to reduce antibiotics, okay? And this is um, some UK data on um, oral antibiotics. Um, and a lot of flocks, uh, both UK and Ireland, are still getting oral antibiotics at birth. We know that legislation is changing. Now, if you look at some of the veterinary records, again, this is a, a slide from the veterinary record, around overall use of antibiotics in flocks is quite low. We see an increase, of course, at lambing time due to risks around la for lambs, but also for yos and lameness being indoors. Um, 
but we definitely can see we definitely are doing a very good job but there is a huge focus now on reducing oral antibiotics prophylactically for lambs and um, particularly controlling water mouth and it's important to remember antibiotics are very useful tools we still need them we need to use them as much as necessary but as little as possible and um, so if we look at why we want to avoid oral antibiotics well it's really simple because the more exposure we have of bacteria to antibiotics, the more resistance develops. And if we think about the digestive tract and all the bacteria, both good commensals and beneficial bacteria that are in there, we want to minimize exposure to, back to antibiotics. Because what happens is if you have a population of naive bacteria, we administer oral antibiotics, um, it takes out a certain amount of good and bad bacteria, um, and all that's left over time is resistant bacteria. So particularly if we resistant pathogens, like resistant E. coli, um, we're selecting for resistant bacteria. And that resistant bacteria can actually, they can, they can spread through a process of their sharing of DNA, that resistance to other bacteria. So really, it makes complete sense that we want to re re massively reduce the use of antibiotics, but particularly oral antibiotics as a preventative for disease. And that's why Precision Microbes Advanced Gold Stabilizer is part of that story. So it's a new product. There's lots of challenges for the young lamb. Um, the challenge of the reduction of antibiotics, not the removal, but the reduction. Um, this is a super product, and I'm going to talk about why this product is different as well. And it's an, a quite an exciting product. Uh, we did uh, trials in spring of 2022. It's been commercially available in spring 2023, and hearing really positive feedback from both vets and sheep farmers. So the newborn lamb challenges. Well, if we look at lambing indoors, um, the Feeding prepartum for the O is really important. There's a lot of pressure on birthing and hard lambings. They're born immune and naive. They need colostrum. They're very prone to the cold. Um, hygiene is a major challenge when we have a lot of sheep lambing down in the one period of time, particularly at times of year when the weather can be variable and very suitable for bacterial growth with high humidity uh, and the stress of just poor weather in, in general. Um, and they need to get going quickly. So some of the main diseases that lambs are, are faced with is E. coli, watery mouth, navel infections, joint ill is becoming more prominent, uh, clostridial diseases, and as the lambs get a little bit older, pneumonia. They're the main ones we see. So we know the colostrum is huge. Um, it's influenced by prepartum feeding, particularly protein and energy. There's a 60% increase in protein energy demand coming up to lambing time for colostrogenesis. So the better we do with nutrition of the yews pre-lambing, the better quality we'll have. The quantity is somewhat based on genetics, somewhat based on, on um, parity and also um, the amount of feed that they're getting, but we want the right quantity going in, so a liter to a lamb over the first 24 hours. And we want to get that colostrum in quickly because the gut's quite open and it closes down. So absorption of those very important antibodies, these little Y-shaped guys here, the red guys, uh, decreases uh, after six to 10 to 12 hours. So we want to get it in quickly. So if a, a lamb has had a hard lambing, this is where we might stomach tube in colostrum or weak lambs and it's really important to know what it's doing um, and it's really interesting when you look at colostrum and this is going to be the next decade of the colostrum conversation is all the other ingredients in colostrum aside for those all important antibodies that high fat and protein content there's a load of um, hormones and other uh, uh, elements that are set to prime the young gut. And that's really important conversation when we think about the benefits of quality colostrum and actually its role in um, gut health and future immunity of the lamb. So if we think about colostrum, colostrum actually contains elements of prebiotics, which are seeding, helping seed out the young gut and growing. And it's a very important concept when we look at epigenetics. So again, I'm hidden behind uh, this, a little bit of this slide's hidden behind my head, but if we look at um, a very good example that's used very commonly is, um, you know, your worker, uh, your, your, your worker bee and your queen bee are actually born similar, except the queen bee feeds on the royal jelly to start off with when she comes out of her pupae. And the difference in size 
the difference in longevity of lifespan, um, it's a completely different uh, bee to the worker bee. And this is this idea of epigenetics. So animals can be born similar, like twins, but there can be certain influences that are external that will impact the genetic uh, ability and growth of that animal. Uh, and we see that in lambs, that there can be negative effects uh, that have a negative effect, and then below me there is a positive arrow here. And that's the positive benefits of epigenetics. And colostrum quality and quantity has a huge role to play in the young lamb's gut development. Okay, so when we look at the main elements of flock rearing, I think it's getting colostrum quite, uh, from a lamb health perspective, get colostrum quality right, uh, preparative feeding is huge, practicing hygiene at lambing, minimizing hard lambings, factoring in the risk of cold for lambs, plenty straw bedding, and having protocols around weak lambs can really, simple things can make a huge difference. And we think about infectious disease, in any animal, humans or anything, we think about the lamb, we're trying to, it's like a seesaw effect, we're trying to increase the immunity piece over here, which is our ability to fight infection, we're trying to knock this level of seesaw down and reduce infection pressure, that's good hygiene and pathogens, and that's, you know, if we have animals shedding and spreading disease, that's why we like to do tests to see what animals are carrying diseases, because they, as a source of disease, can increase infection pressure. So, that's the main elements. Now, I want to talk a little bit about gut health in the lamb and in general species. When we think about microorganisms, I've done a lot of, com a lot of talking about pathogens. Um, but we've all sorts of microorganisms, including viruses, paras or protozoa, bacteria, fungi. And a lot of these can be of benefit to our animals. When we think about a microbiota, so there are microorganisms, that's a collection of these organisms in a specific area. So we can have a vaginal microbiota, we can have a gut microbiota, a skin microbiota, and a lung microbiota. When we talk about a microbiome then, that's a more of an organized collection of a, a specific microorganisms in a specific environment. So the gut microbiome is very much like an other organ because it has three incredibly important roles. It's involved in digestion, it's involved in immune function and competition with harmful pathogens. When we look at how the lambs get their gut microbiome, this is really interesting, um, how do they actually develop a, 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 a healthy gut microbiome in their first hours and days and weeks of life? Well, through vaginal delivery, they pick up a lot of the vaginal microbes from their mother. Um, and what happens is um, these can develop over time and that's why prebiotics are really important because they're a feed source for these good bacteria. What we don't want is harmful pathogens going into the young lamb's gut before it's seeded out and this gut microbiome develops. So anything we can do to help the young lamb's gut develop, well that's really important. That's part of the role precision microbes advanced gut stabilizer is playing. It's a complementary feed designed to promote good gut health as well as protect the young vulnerable lamb. That's a really important thing when we think about lamb growth and thrive. So the lamb gut microbiome is like other species. Colostrum is where it starts. It develops over the first few weeks of life and it's key to digestive health, immune function and competing with pathogens. So we're trying to target with a disadvanced gut stabilizer the promotion of a healthy, good gut microbiome. And that's why in the advanced gut stabilizer it's been used to propagate it, we've used prebiotics, probiotics, and postbiotics. So the pre and probiotics are really around helping promote good gut health in the lamb for the first hours and days uh, of life, which will impact through epigenetics its future performance. So in an ideal world, our lamb is born um, and it picks up healthy vaginal microbes from its mother, seeding out its young gut, it gets plenty of colostrum and antibodies, and that's the ideal world. We need very little intervention with perfect management. Unfortunately, the reality in our flocks means we do have a lot of extra challenges, um, particularly when we look at seasonal lambing, a lot of yours lambing around the same time. We do have challenges. So there's lots of entry points, there's lots of potential pathogens. Orally certainly is the main risk for E. coli, but we can look at tagging ears, docking tails, we can look at all the equipment we're using with lambs, we can look at the navel as a potential source, and we think about bedding and infection pressure. So there's lots of challenges for the newborn lamb when it comes to pathogens. So if we think about immunity and we think about infection pressure and think about that balancing, well, it makes a lot of sense that what I was talking about to start around 
bedding, a space, drainage, fresh air movements. Well, that helps with having the other clean. And then if we think about the environment the lambs are in, when they're indoors, obviously it makes a lot of, if the weather is favorable, getting lambs out makes complete sense because that infection pressure is reduced bar we have inclement weather. Um, so infection pressure is that hygiene piece, immunity is that colostrum piece and all the management practices we do with handling and managing young lambs. But colostrum is the big one. Advanced gut stabilizer is designed as a tool to aid farmers during this period of challenge. And what's interesting when you look at pathogens, just to put it into context, to talk a lot about pathogens, and as a vet, we always talk, as a vet, I always talk about pathogens when we think about infection pressure. Um, well, if we look at the percentage of beneficial microorganisms, the pathogens are maybe beneficial uh, bacteria and commensals that are you know, beneficial or are, are, are negative, it, it's about 99%, 99.9%, so just 0.1% pathogens. So beneficial microbes have a huge role to play. And this is why we talk about good bacteria and the use of beneficial bacteria in the gut, maybe in the environment of, of animals using different blends to control the bacterial pressure, um, but particularly in the gut. And a lot of bac good bacteria will compete with harmful bacteria in the gut by the production of postbiotics. So these bacteria will produce postbiotics that will inhibit or um, through quorum sensing a, a huge range of mechanisms with enterocins, bactericins and nitrous oxide is a huge different element to postbiotics but essentially um, they can control uh, or compete with harmful pathogens and we have a good examples of postbiotics that bacteria produce we now use uh, commercially penicillin was actually a metabolite or postbiotic of, of penicillin rubens a fungus and actually ivermectin was a metabolite or a postbiotic metabolite of a streptomyces bacteria discovered by Satoshi Amuro in Japan. So we, what I'm trying to say here is that when we think about pathogens and we think about bacteria, we also must remember the role potentially of beneficial bacteria, in particular their ability to compete with harmful bacteria. So at Precision Microbes, our research is very focused on looking at the blends, the species, the propagation, and how they're functioning through metabolomics and, and potentially could be part of the solution for the reduction of antibiotics and improvement of health in different farming animals and systems. So good gut health development. This is important. Uh, ideally, when a lamb is born, we want them to pick up the healthy vaginal microbes, but there's lots of challenges there. Um, we also want them to get colostrum, we want to get the immunity, the prebiotics, and all those elements are going to help with the growth of the young gut. But we know there's lots of pathogens there. So um, I suppose when we think about um, uh, our advanced gut stabilizer that contains prebiotics, uh, probiotics for beneficial bacteria and postbiotics in their propagation and, and our uh, culturing process to develop this complementary feed where we're supporting good gut health. Now when we look at watery mouth and um, we think about E. coli, uh, the primary risk on farm is the mothers because they have the original source of it, they're not affected by it but it's in their feces, it can be in water and the challenge with E. coli when it gets into the gut or gets into places where there's a, uh, an availability for it to, to, to thrive and we think about the young lamb without colostrum in its, in its stomach, it's a fairly neutral pH, it's a nice medium for bacterial multiplication. So if lambs are exposed to fecal material or E. coli through our handling of their mouths or um, through the birthing process, well, it multiplies every 20 minutes. And if you have billions of E. coli in there, that gets into big numbers. And when these bacteria die, when E. coli die, it's got a cell wall or cell membrane, it's a gram-negative bacteria, that breaks down and it's actually the cell wall um, releases these lipopolysaccharides or toxins um, that cause effects. So it's a big challenge. We're up against a significant pathogen. So that's why management is key. And um, that's why oral antibiotics have been effective in the past. But we're now realizing we need to move away from them, so we need to come up with new ways of dealing with these challenges. The perfect storm for watery mouth has been like the last couple of weeks and farm in Ireland here anyway, with poor inclement weather, um, knock on effect, you know, if you've hard lambings, uh, your weaker lambs, you know, poor hygiene, and as I said, a high stomach pH in the young lamb before it ingests colostrum is quite an environment. So even sometimes with good colostrum management, it can overcome um, that, that infection pressure can, can overcome it. Remember, we're always balancing these two. So, yeah, it's DC coli producing these toxins, so they produce these lipopolysaccharides. So the challenge is, 
Well, if we have a lot of E. coli in the environment and lambs are exposed to it, that E. coli gets into that young gut, that young st stomach with a high pH. If it gets in there before colostrum, it multiplies rapidly. It produces this endotoxin. So even if the colostrum goes in on top of it after, it can be a real challenge. And what's happening with E. coli at a cellular level is it's breaking down, releasing these toxins that go in and cause the endotoxic shock we talk about with lambs. So that watery mouth, the watery belly, it's a systemic shock from the toxins produced by E. coli dying, and particularly the cell wall or cell membrane, cell membrane, I should say, of the bacteria. So antibiotics have, a, have had a role to play, and we do talk about them as much as necessary and as little as possible. And this is something you'll talk with your own vet, veterinarian around, but it's about realizing that, okay, certainly when we put in um, uh, antibiotics to pathogens we can kill them but it has a negative effect on all the other good bacteria and we are selectively you know if we look at uh, using oral antibiotics we're knocking out the susceptible bacteria the resistant bacteria survive so we could be over prolonged use of oral antibiotics just selecting for resistant e coli which creates huge challenges for long-term uh, health on the farm and as farmers working with them uh, working with our lambs and sheep we don't want to have multi-resistant E. coli in our farms because it's a risk to ourselves. But primarily from an animal health perspective, it's poor practice. So we now know that we want to reduce the use of oral antibiotics, minimize them certainly, use them where necessary, and not use them pro prophylactically, which means to prevent disease. Joint ill is also becoming a big challenge. Um, it's strep dyscalacti, I think I might have called it strep agalacti earlier on. It's very challenging because it's spread from carrier yo, so our healthy yo can look healthy. They are the main source of it, and then we can spread it with our hands and utensils. So that's why lambing time, especially where joint ill is an issue, we want to maximize hy hygiene because we can still see joint ill, even when we do a good job on colostrum management. There's an excellent uh, webinar on ADHB, webinar on YouTube by uh, Flock Health Specialist and Vet Fiona. I love it on this in more detail, but it can be very difficult to treat because when it gets into lambs, it does, it's very erosive on the joint surfaces causing a lot of challenges. Um, and anywhere we're breaking skin, I have found with flocks with joint tail, um, two things I watch, I watch the weather and environment for favorable conditions. Uh, with flocks with high levels of carrier yos, I look at hygiene, but also where we're breaking the skin for maybe tail docking or ear tags, I focus in on hygiene there and actually disinfect tags and lambing rings uh, on farms has helped as part of an overall protocol. I have a lot of flocks using advanced gut stabilizer now that have had joint ill issues previously with, fa with favorable feedback um, around reducing the risk. And if we think about the pathogenesis of strep, the strep bacteria, well, it would make sense that the protective effect would be of some benefit, um, but in conjunction with good management, I think. So precision microbes is very different. Um, this is a complementary feed, but it's propagated using prebiotics, which are there to support the young gut, probiotics there to support the young gut, and the postbiotics that they, the bacteria produce, which like, so bacteria are like factories, it's the postbiotic metabolites that they produce are really important. We formulated this specifically, um, a, this unique lamb uh, formulation um, by pr the production of postbiotics that are targeted at E. coli. It's not an antibiotic, but it has been specifically designed for that young lamb and the risks associated with uh, lambing time. So the po postbiotics are very specific. So when we think about prebiotics, we think that we thought about colostrum, we think about um, probiotics, we think about the beneficial bacteria, but what they actually produce, the bacteria, postbiotics, these are really key when we think about this advanced gut stabilizer. So one of our uh, benefits is we're always using live beneficial bacteria. We're using the production of metabolites uh, or postbiotics in our liquid. So, and we also have prebiotics. So this advanced gut stabilizer has pre, pro and postbiotics in the liquid. Uh, we think about probiotics in general. A lot of times we're using them in a freeze-dried format. So we take the bacteria and we actually freeze-dry it because we can put it into a paste or a powder. And uh, certainly reduces volume, but those bacteria have to survive stomach acid. They have to, you know, reactivate. Um, and in general, uh, it, that takes time and then produce these all important metabolites. Whereas we are, um, a, you know, a liquid, all our products are based around this liquid pro and postbiotic principle. 
At gut level, what does this mean? So prebiotics are really important because they're the feed for the good bacteria. They help seed it. So if we go down to a very cellular level, each individual cell is just a cell between the gut, digested here in the lamb's gut, and the, uh, all these immune cells in the gut. 70% of the lamb's gut, or 70% of the immune systems in the lamb's digestive tract. So when we think about prebiotics being in there, well, they actually help seed out and feed uh, the development of a healthy gut microbiota. Uh, we think about the postbiotics, um, these are really important as well because they're th what the bacteria produce. So we're really targeting um, a whole range of elements to gut health. And because of that, we're promoting gut health, but also providing some protection for the young lamb as well. Water mouth is really difficult and really challenging. So what we've seen and the research I've been involved with is E. coli multiplies so rapidly that some of the competition that we would have used in different blends like our calf product is not good enough. We would have done extensive studies on that. So we wanted something that was going to be more appropriate to compete faster to protect the young lamb. It's not an antibiotic, but the postbiotics are specifically formulated for that rapid multiplication of E. coli. So if we think about uh, the product itself, it's all about the post the prebiotics to help support young, that young gut, the probiotics also to help support the young gut, and the postbiotics being very specifically uh, targeted at, at that challenge of E. coli in particular. But I suppose it's been nice to get the feedback in those flocks with, that have been challenged with joint tail or trying to remove oral antibiotics to every lamb, um, seeing positive benefits as well. So better gut health, it's not an antibiotic, <clears throat> it's an alternative approach. It's focused on the postbiotics we use during propagation, and they've been blended specifically for the challenge of the young lambs. It's a tool. Um, it also contains prebiotics and probiotics in the blend to kickstart the young lambs' immature gut microbiome, supporting gut health. So I talk about protection and promotion of better gut health. It's really important in flocks that this isn't a one-fits-all miracle solution. Work with your own vets. Many flocks during periods of challenge will still need antibiotics. They're an important tool. But certainly this tool, when used correctly, is going to reduce the overall uses of antibiotics. And we've seen because of legislation changes, it's good timing to have something like this in the cabinet as a tool in flocks at lambing time. It's dosed at birth six mils uh, as a once-off or it can be used supportively as well for lambs that are maybe recovering from diarrhea upsets, older lambs, but there's a couple of dose rates. So uh, these are two vet practices we did trials with in 2022. Keep forgetting the years, now it's 2023. So last year we were put into 13 flocks and um, all these flocks were removing oral antibiotics and going uh, cold turkey and we use precision microbes advanced gut stabilizers to support gut health um, and the vets tracked issues like joint tail watery mouth or lamb mortality it was extremely positive again these were uh, observational studies on flocks that were transitioning from antibiotics and the vets you can read the testimonials on our website on, on what they saw it it's a po very positive tool we also used it in a flock during an outbreak um, with good results as well around control. So again, it's available through vet practices in Ireland, uh, both south and north. Um, and it is a product that really, I think, when you look at it, uh, at the overall concept of the challenges we face in flocks, it's certainly a very valuable tool that now vets and farmers have in their arsenal. We look at lamb health and gut health. So dosage rates, uh, there's a 300 ml bottle, and, and that means if we're giving every lamb six mils at birth, um, with that 300 ml bottle will cover up to 50 lambs. Again, it can be used in older lambs that are recovering maybe from digestive upsets where we want to move away from oral antibiotics. Again, here uh, at one mil per kilo. So if you have a five kilo lamb, uh, five mils for three to five days, and again, really positive feedback here again on its use on helping that those lambs recover from digestive upsets. So that's it. Um, I think we have game-changing solutions in the animal health space. There's no doubt about that with precision microbes. But um, this is the next cha game changer in the lamb gut health space. If you have any uh, questions about the product or any more information, you can give us a shout directly on info at precisionmicrobes.com. That's info at precisionmicrobes, all the one word, dot com. 
Thank you. If you're still with me listening to the end, I think this is a really exciting product. Um, given back the feedback we're getting from the lambing season in 2023 from both vets and farmers. Um, and I suppose with the challenges that are there, giving farmers an alternative tool in the medical cabinet uh, or in the, the health cabinet, we'll call it, uh, around lambing time. Thanks for listening.